unexpectedly started a global movement. How does anyone unexpectedly start something like that? Well, for me, it started with a moment of realization. You know when you have something that you really care about, a cause, something you wish you could change in the world? Maybe it's in our environment or in our society. But often, we're left to feel just a bit helpless, like we don't really know what we can do. And that helplessness can lead to just not doing anything at all. Because really, what can one person do when sometimes the problems can seem so huge and complex? Well, I had that feeling. But then I had a moment where I went from feeling completely helpless to seeing full clarity on what I could do to help change just one thing. And that one thing did change something and has gone on to impact thousands of people's lives. So that moment happened for me a few years ago. Back in the summer of 2015, I found myself sitting in front of the TV watching the news. Now, I was on maternity leave, so I'd taken a year off from working as a designer in the creative industry to look after my newborn little girl. And I remember as I sat there on the sofa, I had her in a rocker by my feet. And on the news, they were reporting about the refugee crisis in Europe. And with the, the refugee crisis had had an unprecedented volume of coverage in the news that summer. And with the upcoming winter ahead, millions of people were going to be left cold in camps across Europe and the Middle East. Now, I'd been following the crisis in the news for a while, and I'd always felt a strong connection to it. And I think it's because of my background and where I'm from. So my parents emigrated to the UK from Bangladesh back in the 1970s. And I guess like many immigrants, you have this sort of duality in your identity, where you're very much from here, but you're also strongly connected to somewhere else. And how, at the stroke of just chance, my life could have turned out to be very different. So when I saw pictures like this in the news, <clears throat> I didn't see refugees or swarms or people coming to take our jobs. I saw my family. I saw my parents there on that boat. My daughter being handed precariously over some rocks my siblings, my aunties and uncles and cousins from back home, all there in that image. And I felt strongly connected to them, instantly. I felt like it could have been me, and it could have been any of us. And I wanted to do something, anything, to help alleviate what they were going through. So this was when I had that moment of realization. See, while I was watching the TV, I looked down and saw that I had the answer right there in my hands. You see, while watching TV, I had been knitting a beautiful, chunky beanie. And it looked a little bit like this. Here's one I made earlier. And as I was finishing off this beanie, as I made stitch after stitch after stitch, I just froze. I had this light bulb moment. It clicked, metaphorically as well as literally. Of course, I could send this beanie that I'm making there to them where it's needed. So right away, I went online to check exactly what it was they needed. And it turned out they did need things like beanies and gloves and scarves and snoods and socks and jumpers, all of these things that I already enjoyed making. So I decided right then that I would collect a few more knitted items and drive down to a local donation drop-off point to me um, for a local um, refugee camp, which at the time was Calais. And I thought, well, if I'm going to go all the way there, then maybe I should check to see if there were any other knitters around me who wanted to donate items too. So right away, I opened up my laptop and opened a Facebook page. And I named it Knit Aid. And on that Facebook page, I uploaded a simple knitting pattern for people to follow. Now, what I did next, however, was in hindsight not a very clever thing to do. On that knitting pattern, I put an address for people to send their donations to. My home address. And can you imagine what happens when you put your home address on the internet? 
especially in aid of refugees. Well, <coughs> don't worry, nothing bad happened. In fact, the complete opposite happened. What happened was extraordinary. Because one day, I remember when I came home and I walked through the front door, there in my spare bedroom were hundreds and hundreds of knitted donations. This is a picture I took from that first day. This is... <laughs> This is as much as I could fit in the lens of my camera. I couldn't zoom out enough from the room. The room was full to the brim. I received um, donations from knitters, from knitters, not only from the UK, but all over the world. I remember opening up packages from as far as the US, from Malaysia, even from Australia. I received messages from people asking me, from around the world, asking where their nearest knit aid branch was. I mean, they had no idea that it was just me sitting in my little old house opening these packages by myself. And we had so many different types of people that knitting for us as well. So it could have been anywhere from a mother teaching their child or a teenager teaching their dad a few stitches to go towards a scarf. We had schools in Europe, across Europe, adding knit aid into their school curriculum so that they could teach children about the craft as well as the crisis. We had workplaces and stores and cafes and libraries opening up their spaces so people could get together to knit for Knit Aid. And this was the bit that surprised me, actually, that Knit Aid not only offered people the chance to do something, but it got them together. It got them to come together in a space and talk about and think about this specific cause. And it got them to talk about what they were going to be doing next. So Knit Aid was a sort of catalyst that sparked all the other steps that people were going to be doing moving forward. You see, what started off as just a simple idea ended up activating communities all around the world. Now, since uh, sending that first beanie to camp, <coughs> we had opened up, well, Knit Aid had opened up the knitted floodgates and there was no stopping it. So since sending that first beanie, Knit Aid has now gone, out, gone to send 14, over 14,000 donations into refugee camps across Europe and the Middle East. 14,000. That's 14,000 heads, hands, necks and feet, children, mums and dads, just that little bit warmer because of kindness. We've gone from just me to a small but mighty team of volunteers who help run it. And one of those volunteers is a co-director, and that person, Karen and I, and our two-woman power team who run Knit Aid together on the side of our full-time jobs and families. You'll be pleased to know that my address is now off the internet, <laughs> and we've gone from my small spare bedroom to a large storage unit where people send their donations to. We send to camps in France, Greece, Italy, Turkey, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria. See, what was just one step, one beanie, a Facebook page, plus a network of like-minded people, ended up impacting thousands of people's lives. So there's a reason why an idea like Knit Aid works so well. And it's because of a combination of two feel-good feelings. So research has shown <coughs> that there's a neural link between generosity and happiness. I think we all know that, right? So when we do something kind or something that benefits someone else, it feels good because our brains release endorphins. But in addition to that, research has shown a neural link between happiness and knitting. <laughs> and other making activities too. So when we're making and creating, and maybe we're using our hands, maybe we have something to show for it at the end, it feels good. So imagine combining the two, making and giving. I like to call it a double whammy explosion of goodness. Double the endorphins, double the happiness. And that's what we'd created with Knit Aid. It was a win-win. So that first beanie that I made in front of the TV, it was a really nice beanie. The type of beanie that I would wear myself or gift to someone that I loved. And I wanted the recipient to know that I hadn't just gone to the shops and bought it for them, but that I made it for them, and that I thought about them with every stitch. And so I wrote a label 
and attach it to the beanie saying exactly that. And since then, we've encouraged all of our knitters to only send us quality handmade gifts they would give to someone they loved and to write messages of their own. And here are just some of them. May your journey be a safe one and your destination a happy and peaceful place. I learned to knit just so I could knit this for you. Know that there are people in this world supporting you and envisioning your success, even if you don't see us. I'm eight to six years old and had many happy and sad times. I hope your sad times are ending and many happy times are coming. I'm thinking of you. I hope the war ends from a year five class in Iceland. Never let anyone tell you that you're not welcome here because you most definitely are. Reading these messages is one of my favorite parts about Knit Aid. We're often sitting there in our storage unit opening up these packages with tears in our eyes. It reminds me that the world can be good and we have so much to give. So as we sent those messages and gifts to them, which were distributed by volunteers already working on the ground in camps, something unexpected happened again. We started to hear back from them, because when they knew that there were people all around the world knitting for them, they realized that they could knit for themselves, that they could knit for their own family members and people around them and sell or exchange them in local markets to help sustain themselves. And people were already amazing crafters living in the camps. And so they asked us to send them knitting materials, and we did exactly that. And with one pilot, we sent them knitting materials and patterns. They knitted for us, and we sold them back here in the UK for a higher profit, where they received all of the funds. And here are some of those items. They're beautiful, aren't they? We sold out of these instantly. You see, knitting not only empowered them, it put tools in their hands to sustain themselves. And as we sent knitted items with messages to them, we received back knitted items with messages too. And here's one of those messages. Now, I've changed the name that's hidden, but it reads, made by Nazanin, originally from Afrin, Syria. Eight members now live in Izmir, Turkey. There aren't many words on that label, but with a message like that, you could not deny a human story. A mother, parents, children, and family members. How did they get there? What has that been like for them? Could we imagine if we had to move our families? But also, what did they enjoy doing? What did they used to love doing back home? What incredible skills do they have to offer? You see, in sending those first few batches of donations, we had created a bridge, a bridge that crossed the very borders that so many were unable to cross themselves. But it was a one-way bridge. When we started to hear back from them, we went from a one-way bridge of giving to a two-way bridge of giving and receiving back. It wasn't just about what we had to offer them, but what they had to offer us. And it wasn't just about us fulfilling a short-term need, but for us listening to and responding to what they knew what they would need in the long term. And this listening and responding, iterating and being flexible as we go, it's something we continue to do um, with Aid even today. So for example, we know that many people, when they resettle in a new country, especially young people, they suffer from isolation and depression. And so we plug into an already existing organization that supports them in many other ways, and we run craft workshops for resettled young refugees in London. Craft gives them a boost of feel good and integration, a chance to connect over a shared activity. You see, those feel good feelings, they're not just for us, the, knitter, the givers. If helping people feels good, 
then helping them do what makes them feel good feels even better. So you might think that it takes a special kind of person to make something like knit aid work. People say it to me all the time. Wow, Shanaz, you must be some kind of superwoman. How do you do it all? Well, I'm going to tell you my secret. There is really nothing special or out of the ordinary about what I did. I made one beanie and took one step at a time. I did what I could when I could, and I learned along the way. But most of all, I wanted to do only what was best for the cause and the people I so wanted to help. And I think that if, I'm, if I can make something like Knit Aid work, then we're all capable of offering what we can, when we can, to fulfill needs, but also empower people along the way. Knit Aid has taught me a few lessons about how I go about changing something. And I find it applies to so many areas of my life. It's taught me that it's OK to start small, that we can't individually solve huge and complex problems, but that we're a little bit closer to doing so when we collectively do it together. But I think most of all, it's taught me that we all have a part to play. We all have something to offer. So not everyone has to start a knit aid, but maybe you enjoy making, so you donate to us regularly. Or maybe you enjoy actively getting involved, so you help us unpack our boxes. Maybe you enjoy a little bit of admin, so you help us to answer our emails. Or you enjoy sharing good news, so you share our posts online. Everyone has something to offer. And I mean everyone. Because maybe you enjoy making, but you're sitting in a camp. And you're using your skill to help regain a bit of stability again. Or maybe you're a young boy in a new and unfamiliar country. But you like learning. And you've just learned a new skill. And you're teaching a new friend that skill without even using any language. Everyone has something to offer, and that is the biggest lesson for me. Our community is only a community where we include everyone. If we can apply this thinking into our everyday lives and how we rethink about giving, then person by person, action by action, and stitch by stitch, we're on our way to creating a better, fairer, and more connected world. Thank you.